The schedule's actually been out for months. Everyone knows which teams they were going to play out of the 17 games they're going to play. But the NFL makes a really, really big deal, and boy, are they good at this, making a televised spectacle of releasing the dates and the times. And then after that, we all look at the dates and the times and say, hmm, what does this mean? Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. Obviously in an unusual mood to get the day going here. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of the other two teams I cover in town, the Penguins and the Pirates. It will be Steelers versus Bengals at Paul Brown Stadium on Sunday, September 11, a 1.02 p.m. kickoff, a CBS broadcast, pretty conventional stuff. They're not making some great big drama out of the Bengals having been the team that represented the AFC in the Super Bowl. And they're not really making, you know, some big thing out of the Steelers post Ben Roethlisberger. If they were doing that, if we're being honest with ourselves, they'd make it the Sunday night game or a Monday night game or a Thursday something or other. And they're not doing that. It's an AFC North football game with a Sunday 1 p.m. kick. And I got to tell you, just just right there. Inside that prism, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with a regular old Sunday football game against the team that's probably, even though DJ Reader took it too far, the measuring stick for the remainder of the division, for as long as they've got that quarterback and those wide receivers anyway. But other than that, and that there's a visit to the other Ohio franchise in week three, is probably the extent of my takeaways from anything meaningful on this schedule. It's at Bengals, it's the home opener against the Patriots, and then it's at Browns. I see that as an opportunity, and I would be stunned if the head football coach in the building wouldn't see it the same way. It's an opportunity. There's going to be, there already is, an awful lot of doubt about this team, despite, as we've talked about here for weeks now, there being still a ton of talent there, including the defensive player of the year. But until they go out and make a statement, and by that I don't mean a statement to me or you, because a statement to me or you might be, you know, doing something to the Patriots in week two because there's the Patriots and because Bill Belichick and his hoodie will be right there on the opposing sideline in front of everyone at Heinz Field. But the statements that count inside that locker room, and this has been true for a long time and it's not about to change with Ben gone, is winning inside the AFC North. I will remind that whenever Ben won his final regular season game in Baltimore, that he stood in front of the locker room, looked at some of the younger guys, specifically at Najee Harris, and said, never forget this feeling. Never forget what it feels like to win in an AFC North stadium. He said something similar earlier in the year when they did it in Cleveland. He was clinging to that. He loved winning in those places. And obviously, he loved it a lot. That, to me, is an opportunity. That is a way that this head coach and all of his assistants can have everyone laser focused on being as ready as possible, entering the full schedule way better than if it had been, I don't know, you know, New Orleans or whoever, just some random team at the top there would have felt just like another preseason game. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you'd prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's gorgeous downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online, maybe a flexible hybrid format. 
would work best for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. Now, beyond that, it's a tough, theoretically, first half. Because once you get past Bengals, Patriots, and Browns, okay, there's the Jets in week four at home. But then it's at Buffalo. Then it's Tom Brady and the Bucks. Then it's at Miami. Then it's at a Philadelphia team that probably should be better than they were last year, if not necessarily world beaters. And then comes the bye week. There are significant challenges within that. I mentioned Belichick. I can throw in Brady. Only now you have to face them in two separate weeks. And as far as the Bills go, the Steelers have generally handled them pretty well in the age of Josh Allen. But you never know if they might finally make that next step that everybody's been waiting for for a while. The release of the schedule, to repeat myself, isn't about the teams. We knew the teams. It's about the rhythm. It's about the way they come at you. Now, one interesting observation that I've heard people make over the years when talking about the NFL schedule in terms of the significance of dates is that the later that you play the good teams, the greater the chance they're going to be missing more guys to injury, in particular the quarterback. The quarterback is the one variable, the one enormous variable that alters every outlook at every schedule. Just looking at the Bengals and nobody else, if they come to town and don't have Burrow for whatever reason, all of a sudden, instantly, they are a team that you should beat. So within that, seeing Burrow right up front, and then again on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, yeah, you're probably going to get something close to his best, something close to his receiver's best and Joe Mixon's best, and that offense is going to be a handful. The other thing I try to identify when the schedule comes out is a string of games that might cut you a little bit of a break, that if things aren't going well, you have a chance to get right against not just one team, but maybe another team after that. So one of the things that I do like is that after Thanksgiving, there's a Monday night game at Indianapolis and a Sunday game that same week, a little bit of a short rest issue, in Atlanta. These are not great teams. Indy's obviously better than Atlanta, but then, you know, I'm not about to elevate the team that only needed to go down and win a game in Jacksonville to make the playoffs. That's a cushion that you're looking for somewhere in the schedule. And I think the Steelers might have it there. But otherwise, you know, there there just isn't that much. There isn't a, a, a big, broad trend that you can find, including at the finish. You know, sometimes there's a, hey, maybe if things get tough, you know, look at that December schedule. They can get on a little bit of a roll. Well, that's not really there either. After Atlanta, it's Baltimore. It's at Carolina, which is, again, on the lighter side. Plus, you have home field advantage down there in Charlotte. Then there's Vegas. Then there's the Ravens again. So you have the Ravens twice in four weeks, and then you end, as almost always happens, with the Browns. That one will be at Heinz Field. There's not a real pattern there. There's not something that you can look at and say, oh, well, here's, except for the stuff right at the start, except for that. Because I'm trying to picture how the public will react to this team going into Cincinnati and getting a spanking. Obviously, just being hypothetical here. We did see that occur, you know, twice last year. Will they get buried before they even have a chance to get going? And heaven help us if two weeks later they were to go down in Cleveland. It would feel like the entire rest of the season is lost. Even though, you know, mathematically, it wouldn't be. When we come back, just one question. Welcome 
welcome back. It's time for Just One Question, and that's brought to you always on this program by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garvin, Kelly, and George, LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need assistance with workers' comp and medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been designated Super Lawyers, capital S, capital L, for the past 15 years. And yes, that is a real thing. The Super Lawyer designation is reserved for the top 5% of all attorneys in Pennsylvania. Learn more about them at lgkg.com or by calling 888-842-5454. And today's J1Q comes from Andy Shaw, who asks, when a player is described as a great special teams player, the way you described Derek Watt earlier this week, what specifically does that guy usually do well? Is it open field tackling, field goal blocks? What should fans look for in this underappreciated area? The Connor Hayward draft pick, of course, raised my curiosity on this since he seems like he'll be a big part of that. And Andy, you began to answer your own question by throwing out so many different possibilities. Uh, in each situation, whether it's kickoff coverage, punt coverage, you mentioned the field goal block unit, which if you've ever paid attention to who goes on for the field goal blocks, these aren't special teamers. It would be Cam Hayward, Mika Fitzpatrick, Joe Hayden. They don't mess around when it comes to those units because they have only certain number of guys who have the physical capabilities to perform what's needed in those situations. Case in point is Cam Hayward and his role right there in the middle of being able to use that big body to force his way through the first couple of blockers, usually right between the center and the guard, and to get that monstrous paw up in the air as high as he can. Same goes for the rush of the kicker that comes from the outside. You want guys who have exceptional ability to read, react, and of course, get after the ball once it's snapped. So you have these guys who are all pros, who are veterans, who are out there. So you almost have to even be careful when you're talking about special teamers because that can take on a negative connotation because look who's part of them. But to attempt to answer this in the most broad way, I guess, and since I had referenced them earlier in the week, Derek Watt is very good at getting to the football. Not unlike his brothers. Well, okay, a lot unlike his brothers. But he gets to the football on special teams, and he makes an impact by doing that. Now, sometimes if you're the gunner, for example, the way Darius Hayward Bay was with the team, you are expected to get down there, but you might be expected to get down there just to funnel the ball carrier in a certain direction where you know you've got support behind you. Do you follow me? So in that case, Danny Smith and the rest of the coaching staff aren't going to necessarily measure you by whether or not you got down there and made the tackle, but whether or not you were successful in moving that ball carrier where you wanted him to get moved as opposed to where they wanted it on the return. Now, all of that said, the reason that Snell shows up high in these gradings, is that he does finish the play. He gets there and he makes it happen. He'll bring the guy down. And believe me, no matter what everyone else does right, if you're the one who brings the tackler down, you're the one that's getting all the smacks on the helmet and smacks on the rump and the attaboys from, well, really everyone other than Smith who understood, it might be the only guy who understands what all 11 guys were supposed to be doing out there. And there's obviously one other position that has to come into this, and that's the returns. The Steelers have not been a great return team on special teams, really. They haven't even been particularly good at it since A.B. was doing it. And A.B. is such a freak that you almost can't even compare because you could have had 10 supporting cast guys out there who were nowhere near as good as what you have now. And it wouldn't have mattered because A.B. was magic. A.B. would just find a way. He would spin off things. 
He would change the direction of the flow of the return. He would never allow himself to be funneled. So as you can see, my short answer could very easily wind up in being a very, very long answer. Uh, make the plays. Do what Danny Smith tells you to do. He'll notice it, and in turn, Mike Tomlin will notice it, and you will have a better opportunity of keeping your job in the National Football League, even if we don't notice it or appreciate it. For anyone who doesn't know, the Steelers open rookie camp today on the south side. It'll be the first chance to see Kenny Pickett, George Pickens, and the whole class, not to mention all the UDFAs and everyone else who shows up uh, for this activity. We'll get to hear from them, interview them, all kinds of good stuff. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to talking about it with you beginning on Monday.